Hey friends, I'm your host, Erin Port, and welcome to the Simple Purposeful Living Podcast. Life can be overwhelming and busy, so once a week, I invite you to join me, and together we will make simple tweaks to uncomplicate the hard parts of our life so we can spend more time doing what we love. Welcome back to the Simple Purposeful Living Podcast. Today, I'm so excited to have a special guest with us, Shannon from Paring Down on Instagram. Shannon has been an inspiration to so many, 170,000 on Instagram to date, and her journey of simplifying and decluttering our lives. Through her relatable and practical tips she shares both on her podcast and online, she helps busy women find freedom from the overwhelm of clutter and create spaces that foster peace and joy. She's passionate about helping others take small manageable steps to create homes that truly feel like havens. In response to so many in our community sharing how they felt overwhelmed by their homes, that it wasn't a sanctuary, I knew just the person to invite, and that was Shannon, to offer her wisdom and encouragement with today, with us today. Welcome to the show, Shannon. I'm so honored to be here, and wow, that was just the nicest intro. Thank you. Well, it is all true, and I am secretly just like taking notes over here myself because you are a wealth of knowledge. But for those of my community members who don't know about you, let's start with sharing a little bit about you and what inspired you to start your own simplification and decluttering journey. Sure. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Shannon Laco. Um, I'm a mom of three. My kids are three, four, and six. So I am like in it in life right now, just the chaos 24 seven, which obviously leads into why a decluttered home has become really important to me in my life. We're also a military family. My husband's in the Coast Guard. So we move every three years. I'm currently in Florida, but before here we were in Alaska. So we move a lot. And yet again, that is a reason why living in a decluttered home is important because dragging stuff, you know, 4,000 miles from Alaska to Florida feels a little silly. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of just like big picture who I am, my family. But in terms of decluttering and helping people really pare down what they own to uncover what's important to them, I always kind of put that in there. That's the piece that's really, I'm really passionate about. It's not, we're just getting rid of stuff to have a beautifully aesthetic home. That's usually a byproduct. Your home will look elevated when you own less things uh, and it will be less stressful. All of these are really important reasons to declutter. But more than that is through the process of decluttering, we really uncover what's most important to us, right? We're only keeping the things that we use and that we love and that um, just really add value to our lives. And once we recognize what that is and what those things are, we then have the energy to move through life really only focused on those core values. So I just think it goes a lot deeper. Uh, but I really started this, I guess, Instagram account podcast, like making this a career of mine. Uh, after I moved from Alaska to Florida, like I mentioned, uh, that was a really hard transition for me. I uh, loved Alaska. I am a mountains person. So everyone was like, oh my gosh, you're moving to like the most beautiful beaches in the world on the, you know, the panhandle of Florida, turquoise waters and all of that. And I was like, yeah, so it's way too hot for me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go back to the mountains. I want the orca whales in my backyard. Like I want to be cozy all the time. And uh, anyway, for that and a couple other reasons, the transition was really, really hard. And so even though I had definitely started my decluttering and paring down journey long before then, I really found refuge in it after mm -hmm. moving here. I was like, I'm finally, I'm getting rid of as much as possible. Again, not for the sake of less for less, but I needed to be able to fully breathe. And uh, it just, it felt like what I needed at the time. And so I started sharing that naturally online and things started to grow from there. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a podcast about this because I am not the only one going through this. So that's, that's my little background with paring down. Well, so growing up, I wasn't in a military family, but we moved every two years. And so I learned from a very early age that, yes, carrying around your belongings, you know, when you have to put everything in a truck, man, that really kind of solidifies, like, does this really matter? Is it worth packing up? You know, and so I can relate to a lot of your story, even though it wasn't a military upbringing. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so many people are overwhelmed by clutter, but don't know where to start. So what is your best advice for someone in that position? Yeah, starting is often the hardest part. So mm -hmm. let me encourage you there is that it 
it's kind of like going to the gym, right? Like it's just the worst when you think about doing it. Mm. But once you start, once you're on the machine or you've got the weights in your hand, then it starts to get easier. And then the more you do it, the more you know what you're doing. You're not like trying to figure out what machine to use or like where the buttons are to make the treadmill start and all these things that are the mental roadblocks really, right? And so it it sometimes you still have to kind of force yourself to get up and do it, but you also know the benefits. You kind of have a routine in place of how it's done and it becomes a lot easier and more satisfying, right? Like you feel really, really good. And so you start to actually look forward to it. And so I feel like that kind of that gym uh, analogy works really well with decluttering because it's the exact same way. Excuse me. I'm like a little under the weather. So if I keep <laughs> leaning. Oh, you're, um, good. you're good. You're <laughs> good. Um, so anyways, I will encourage you with that, that getting started is the hardest part, but how do you do that? How do you get started? I always offer three ideas for people who want to start. The number one thing to do is choose somewhere that's going to have a big impact for you. So a lot of times you might think, oh, I need to choose somewhere that feels easy, which is also true. That is the second piece to this. But if you're just, let's say decluttering underneath your bathroom sink, that is cool great. I love that. But you're probably not opening your bathroom sink, uh, like the cupboards underneath enough for that to serve as motivation to continue going. So I like to suggest that people might start in their entryway, in a mud room, something that when you walk in the house, you see that space. And once you've decluttered it, it's going to motivate you to want to do that to the rest of the house. So first is choose somewhere with a big impact. The second would be that easy piece. Choose somewhere that does not have sentimental value. Again, yeah. this is why that that mud room or that entryway is somewhere I like to suggest because you're not usually keeping the, you know, your children's baby clothes there, mm, right? Like, yes. Build the muscle first, you know, before you start diving into those tougher pieces. And then the third thing to do is zone way down. This mm. is going to be what really breaks you out of that overwhelm and that paralyzation. Uh, so let's take a mud room, for example, if I'm so fortunate, we have a teeny tiny mud room, it's all we need, but it is a mud room, which I'm grateful for. And, uh, you know, so say I'm going to just manage the shoes. Which mm -hmm. shoes do we actually wear? Which ones have just, my kids have grown out of, but they're still here in this pile. Where's this pile of paper coming from that's being set over here? What's going on on my cork board? If you have a cork board or you put like flyers and you have, you know, some discounted whatever that expired seven months ago, right? So decide what you're going to do. I'm going to just do the cork board right now. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do the shoes. I'm going to do the hat drop basket, whatever it is, zone it way, way down. I think that's so key because like you said, when we have such a big project, it just feels overwhelming. But when we pare it down, when we tweak just a little piece, we can see that progress and that's way more motivating. I love that. Another yeah. reason, I just like having an aha, like paring down, but then also paring down the project. I love there it. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what tweaks, speaking of tweaks, tiny little things, can we make for clutter that seems to creep back in? Oh my goodness. It's always coming in, isn't it? Whether it's the papers or the things we buy, um, even after a big decluttering session, do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, absolutely. Because this happens to all of us, right? Like we might see the beautiful homes on Instagram. And of course, I mean, I like to share when my house gets a little bit out of control, but a lot of times you're going to see the countertops are cleared off and that's intentional. I want to inspire you to know that you can get there. However, the clutter creeps back in for all of us. All of us are human beings, right? So two big things that I find really, really helpful for me is one, having pre-made decisions, okay? Mm -hmm. so what I mean by this is knowing ahead of time, deciding ahead of time, I am not going to keep every homework assignment, right? Mm -hmm. Like I can love my child and I'm not going to keep 100% of these papers that come home from school and deciding ahead of time which ones you will keep. So you're taking out of that decision fatigue when the things come in your house because clutter, a lot of it is really just delayed decisions, right? Mm -hmm. Do I want to keep this piece of paper or not? So for me, it's like if it's personalized or has their handprint on it, or maybe it's a massive mi milestone in what they're learning, right? Like the first times they do a times table. And I think that the way they wrote it is really cute. I don't know. Like if it is very highly personalized, I consider keeping it and I have a spot, I bring it immediately immediately. I don't go into their, you know, highly organized totes that has like a folder for every year. I have those, but in the moment, I don't have the time to go through, pick my, one of my three kids folders out, put it in the correct year, the whole thing. No, I have one little bin that I run to our little office closet and I pop it inside. And then at the end of every semester, I go and put each kids where it needs to go in a fell swoop. So I'm taking out the difficulty of it. I know pre-made what I'm going to be keeping and where I'm going to be putting it. So I think that's really big. Like you can, I'm just kind of brainstorming. If you have goodie bag items, you know that 
that you keep them all in this, the ones that you are not going to let your kids keep and throw around the house for your dog to eat. You know what I mean? Yes. You put them all in this little bag, in this little corner, wherever it is, you go put them in there. And then once it's full, you, you donate it to their teacher at school or someone who might need those kinds of items. Uh, so it, just think through what you're going to do ahead of time is my number one thing, a tweak to stop things from creeping back up. And then the other big one is altering your consumption. This feels kind of obvious, but if things are creeping back in, it's important to consider the source and why. So two big things to consider are who are you following? on social media in your feed. A lot of times that is where our comparison comes from. You start seeing new water bottles that people have and you're like, that's a cute one. Oh, that looks like it could be better than mine. Or you have people overtly selling you stuff. So consider the source and avoid that. That could even mean avoiding certain stores. Maybe you get really tempted when you're at Target. So you need to start shopping at Walmart because Walmart's just not as cute. So you won't be as tempted to buy things, you know? Mm -hmm. So identify the source of why new things are coming into your house. I love that. I think especially even I have found like, have, like if I, like, um, we can get trigger happy at certain times of the year. So like back to school time, because we're buying all the time and then like the holidays. And so even in the following month saying, you know what, I'm not going to go in those stores. I'm just going to do either a pickup order or maybe even a no spend month to kind of just, because we do, we can get so snap or, you know, trigger happy that it just, we need to take a minute. I love those. I love that. It's a great point that there are certain times of year that you're going to be more tempted than others. And so like make alterations depending on where you are. That's such an intentional and thoughtful choice. Yeah. And it just takes, like you said, a little bit of like stepping back. Life is so busy, but like you said, stepping back and just reflecting, like what is the source of this stuff? Uh, that really is helpful too. And I think too, just remembering that not everybody is getting an Amazon order every single day. Cause sometimes we feel like that that's the norm and it's okay. Like it's okay. Like to have just one Amazon order. I mean, not that it matters, but you know what I'm saying? Like it doesn't, we don't right. need things all the time. You don't okay. need things all the time. Exactly. Need and want are two different things. Yes. Put it in your cart and just let it sit there for a minute. Okay. So for people with kids like you and I with busy households, what are some practical tweaks for keeping their clutter under control on a daily basis? Yeah. So probably the biggest one for me is that we have a running donation bin. I always suggest using a bin that you can actually donate itself uh, because I am lazy. I think we all would like one less step with most yeah. things in life, right? And so I don't want to transfer things from like a cute little, you know, plastic donation bin into a cardboard box and then take it to wherever I'm donating it or arranging the pickup or whatever, right? So for me, we still have a kid in pull-ups. I don't know what, what we're going to do, frankly, when they're not in pull-ups. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't have Amazon box is really coming in very much. Um, but for now, we use that. And I just have a running donation bin where if the kids outgrow their clothes, if I notice a toy that I know for sure they won't notice, I think that there are two different camps. One says you should always include your kids decluttering. Another says just do it behind their back. I fall in the middle. I think every parent knows their kids well enough to know what they will notice and what they will not. If it's something they'll notice, include them, especially if they're of a certain age. If they won't notice, it's fine. Grab it. They, If you know they won't notice it, then they won't notice it and just get yeah. rid of it, right? So that running donation box is huge. Another big one is physical boundaries. Uh, so a lot of times we see boxes and bins and we think, oh, this is just organizational product that's there for aesthetics. But there is really a lot of value in having physical boundaries. And they don't have to be a beautiful bin that you buy from World Market. It can be the fact that you have six drawers in your dresser. So you need to make sure your clothes fit happily in those six drawers in your dresser that are not overflowing. That is a physical boundary. So especially with kids, hold those physical boundaries, especially if they say, I want this other toy, or I want to keep this or whatever. You say, honey, that won't fit in the basket. So maybe we should choose something else to get rid of because we need to make sure it can fit in this toy bin. And for kids particularly, it's helpful for them to have that visual and know, oh, it doesn't fit there. Not just there's not room in the house because you can find a corner somewhere. You know what I mean? But like really drive home those physical boundaries. Uh, another thing that is popular because it works, but is doing a daily reset. Mm -hmm. uh, the kids obviously explode all over the house. I tell my kids all the time, there's nothing wrong with a mess. In fact, messes are a good thing. And then I always ask them, I say, why are messes a good thing? And they know how to repeat back now. They go, because it means we had fun, right? Like, yes. that is great. We don't want to be running around after our kids being like, oh, don't do that. Don't throw that there. Don't blah, blah, blah. Because they're using their imagination. They're hopefully using some of those toys that are driving you crazy. This is a good thing. Messes are a good thing. But that's that's what those daily resets are for, because then you don't get layers of mess. I think that's the biggest thing to consider is that if your home on your counter 
chairs are on your floor or having a day, two, three days a week, more than that, where you haven't picked it up at all. Now you have layers. You have multiple times that the kids have created a mess upon mess. And that's when things begin to feel really overwhelming and out of control. So a daily reset, which might take five to 10 minutes of just picking up the toys really fast and putting more they go, getting the homework off the counter, blah, blah, and you get it all done in a 10 minute reset, then you're not getting those layers that build up. I love that. I always say a little every day keeps the overwhelm away. And it really is, is true. That's a great little phrase. I love it. I know. Well, I like yours. I'm going to use that with my kids. I think that's so good. And I think too, um, so many of us, because of the way consumption has changed, a lot of us didn't grow up with decluttering. Like we learned how to clean and we learned how to cook, but like decluttering because of the way that consumption happens now, it's it's so much greater that I think it, when we can teach our kids these habits at a young age of living within your boundaries and and doing these daily resets, like we're not just raising kids, we're raising future adults and we're setting them up for success when they leave our nest someday. So I love that. And the more we can just explain why, I think it's so good. Yeah, and I think a big piece there too that, is so important is that, like you said, the consumption has increased so drastically that it can't, we can't just keep putting out the fire at the Mm. flames and saying, Hey kids, let's learn how to declutter. That's important because there are plenty of times that things come into our house that we don't purposefully acquire ourselves, right? They just kind of appear, whether it's from school or from whatever it just happens in our house. But another big piece of when we're talking to our kids and working with ourselves is saying, where is the root of the flame coming from? Let's mm-hmm. put it out at the ground. And that's the consumption piece. So I really actually would say I have more conversations with my kids when we are at the store or they, whatever it is about, Hey, we're not getting this now because we don't want to have to declutter it later and talking through all of that. So I think getting to the source and going upstream is really, really important. That's so good. So good. I I was even thinking as you were talking, even when we were like at the state fair and you know, there's like every freebie known to man and my kids are like, Oh, but it's a free water bottle or a free toothbrush. And I'm like, but we don't, we don't need it. So let's let it, somebody else have that, you know, just having that conversation with them. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. The free stuff everywhere is wild to me. I bought like six bottles of wine because you're having people over a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and then they're like at checkout, they're like, congrats, this comes with like this free wine tote. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, please. I don't want it. Don't I do want it. it. You can have it. <laughs> okay. So what's a common mistake you see people make when trying to simplify their homes and how can they avoid it? Okay. So when I think of like simplifying a home, to me, there are these two pieces of the puzzle. One is the decluttering piece, right? And one is like simplifying simplifying, simplifying the routines and that kind of thing. So when it comes to decluttering, I would say that the two biggest mistakes or kind of hangups that people come to me with most often are one, they want to make money on their clutter. And the second would be that they're caught up in where to take their clutter, whether it's because they are worried about the landfills or it just feels really complicated, right? So those are two of the big ones that come up for me a lot. So I would say if you are caught up in trying to make money on your clutter, use that pre-made decision that we talked about a little bit earlier and say, I know when I'm willing to sell something and when I'm not ahead of time. So if I think I can get, and your threshold will be different depending on your needs and where you are in life, and that's great. But let's say you, if I can't make more than $40 on it, then I'm going to go ahead and donate it, then that's going to help you move through your belongings. Because if you are just trying to make money on every last thing you're getting rid of, but you have a ton of clutter in your home, that's going to hold you up big time. You're never going to see the results that that start that motivation or that momentum, I should say, that gets things out of your house, right? So, you know, if you've survived this long without the money from that item, you'll probably continue to survive without the money from that item. I'm not saying that you shouldn't try and make a buck here or there, but maybe have that threat of when it's worth it. And then another one is more of a mindset piece here, which is, you know, you probably heard this before, you're not getting your money back by uh, keeping the item. And you're not going to get the same amount of money for it Mm -hmm. from selling it. We often think that our items are worth way more than another person is willing to pay for them. But instead of seeing that as like a negative thing, as a total waste, consider the fact that you got your money's worth of your item the second you bought it. You got the dopamine hit you were looking for in that moment. You got that jolt of excitement, right? And you also got the lesson moving forward that you don't need to buy these things just for that jolt of excitement because it fades quickly. Mm -hmm. So I like to keep that in 
in mind instead of kicking myself for past choices, saying, hey, that's what I did the best I could at the time. That felt really good in the moment. Thanks, item, for making me excited. And now I have the lesson that I'm not going to fall for that dopamine tri uh, dopamine hit the next time, right? Yeah. And then when it comes to the kind of mistake of holding on to clutter because you're not sure where to take it, when it comes to landfills, this is a big one I actually shared about on my Instagram just this week because it's been coming up a lot. Um, I want to encourage you to remember that whether something is in a drawer in your house or a closet in your house or it's in a landfill, if it is not biodegradable, it will be on this earth when you die. Your home is on earth. <laughs> your house is not in heaven. Not yet, yeah. you know? And so you, you, if you leave it here, it will be here, period, yeah. right? So it's not solving the problem. This is going back upstream. The consumption piece yeah. is the problem. It's this market for new things. So consider how you're consuming items and that will be a far greater impact on our environment than the fact that it'll it'll counterbalance if you have to send some things to the landfill, if you send it to Goodwill and you think, okay, it's probably going to the landfill. Just know that if you've made a different choice moving forward because you feel bad about that experience happening, then the next 30, 40, 50 years of your life with changed consumption is going to far outweigh that moment of sending something to the landfill. Okay. And for the sake of time, let me move on to like the simplifying piece of this, of the mistakes people make when they are trying to simplify their house. Um, they overcomplicate it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So ironically, we we choose the additive bias or we fall into an additive bias, even when we're trying to simplify our home. And an additive, the additive bias means it's this tendency to favor approaches that uh, that solve a problem by adding components to, mm. you know, to the problem instead of reducing the number of components in order to make, uh, in order to see the change, right? It's just as humans, we want to add more things. So we might want to add more technology. Oh, I, if I just set up this kind of routine and this kind of system, and I have Alexa tell me to do this, which don't get me wrong, I use Alexa to remind me to do things all the time, yep. right? But we're adding these different components. We see somebody else has this cute checklist that they have, and we see somebody else does this like Velcro thing to keep their themselves on, on task or whatever. We're overcomplicating simplifying, which is so ironic, right? So like an example for me is like, we just have a whiteboard on the fridge. Call me old fashioned, but that's where we write down what we need for them from the grocery store. We write down our to-do list, right? It's really, really simple. So focus on, on taking away. You know, another one is people try and think, I need to make my home look more cohesive. I'm going to get all this cohesive furniture and blankets and all the stuff to make it look more minimal. You know what's more minimal than having cohesive bar stools is not having bar stools at mm. all. If you don't sit at your kitchen island. We don't sit at our kitchen island. There is a lip for bar stools at our kitchen island and there are none there because we yeah. don't need them. We don't need to sit at our bar stool, right? So instead of getting adding more, consider how you can add less. I love that. And just how you use your space. I love that. So good. So good. I love that. Okay, so we're going to get to some rapid fire questions. So, what is the most difficult thing you've ever decluttered? <laughs> My sweaters, I'm such a sweater girl. So I had to declutter. I had like 50 sweaters at one point. It was sad, but also amazing. They're so cute and cozy. If you're watching on YouTube, she has the cutest sweater on. And I was thinking she's in Florida. Like it's, I love it. I love that you're just I keep my house the inner cozy. I am. I'm embracing it. It's September somewhere, you know? <laughs> it is 90 degrees here in the Midwest. So it is hot everywhere. I'm so ready for fall. Uh, mine is pictures, photographs. Like I put that off forever and it took my husband sitting me down and just sitting beside me to, to finally get it done, which accountability can be so good. So, oh, good. and it wasn't the first thing I started. It was like the last thing on my initial decluttering journey. There you go. I mean, that's more sentimental, you know, with yeah, some photos. Yeah. Well, sweaters can be sentimental, you know? Oh, that's, you know. Mine were not. Mine were just <laughs> cute and I like them. <laughs> okay. One word to describe your home now that it's been decluttered. Uh, I would say welcoming. Mm. I think when people, when I walk in, I feel welcomed by my space. I don't feel like it's yelling at me to take care of it. And then I think other people have commented, you know, your house feels really spacious and open and welcoming. So yeah, I think that has a lot to do with not having stuff everywhere. And I think that that is counterintuitive. People think when you subtract things, it's going to not feel cozy. But what you said there is it's welcoming and you're probably not resistant to having people over because you're not embarrassed about your space, which a lot of people research says they're not having people over because they're embarrassed about the clutter. 
Oh, totally. It totally ups your hospitality on so many different levels. Like, like you said, you're not embarrassed or people don't have to move every single pillow on your couch in order to sit down comfortably. You can say, Hey, you can go grab yourself a glass of water and help yourself make yourself at home. And they're not sorting through a billion different plastic cups in order to find one that they think they should use. Like there are so many reasons. And you know, I'm a cozy girl. I'm wearing my sweater. I wish I lived in Alaska. Coziness is my middle name. And you can do that with a decluttered home. Yes, I love that. Okay, what's a tweak you made this week that has changed your life? Maybe okay. not changed your life, but at least been helpful. No, I mean, it's changed my life. I'm going to tell you. So my kids have some toy kitchen food, you know, like they have a toy kitchen and some toys. And I have mixed feelings about this to begin with. Part of me just wants to chuck the whole thing because they <laughs> used to play chef just using Duplos. They don't need a whole kitchen and realistic food. But anyways, that rant aside, I used to have it micro-organized, which um, for listeners, micro-organizing is when you take something like the food for your toy fridge and you have the things that go in a real fridge in the fridge you put the other ones in the freezer and then you have things that go in the microwave and I used to store it all kind of in a way that made sense and then of course they just chuck the food everywhere and it drove me crazy and it took forever to clean up not forever because we didn't have like that much but it was a pain and so then I was like you know what macro organization it is it's all going in one little bin and so now all the food as of last week just lives in a bin next to the kitchen and that has felt a lot easier Something that I was thinking about when you said that, because we also have a kitchen and I keep thinking like, have we outgrown it? And then I go downstairs and they're using it again. So no, we, we have it still for the little two, but even thinning out how much food we have. And I think that's another thing. Like people think when we declutter, we just have to get rid of the entire collection. But I always tell people like, even if you thin it down by like 25, 30, 50%, we think we're depriving our kids. But what I find is when I thin things out, Again, the things that really matter to them, they can find easily. They're not digging through trying to find, you know, the the glasses or the silverware or whatever. So, yes. Oh, my gosh. And especially with things like that that come in sets, it is such a pit hole or a pitfall or a black hole or I don't know whatever you want to yeah. call it. You fall in deep because then that stuff adds up super fast. So absolutely. Just thinning it out is a win. Yes, I agree. Okay, so we always end every podcast with a tweak that my listeners can take away and implement this week. So if there's one tiny tweak that would help our listeners when it comes to decluttering and simplifying your home, what would you suggest? So you've kind of heard throughout this episode, me talking about going upstream and really nipping in the bud your clutter when it comes to the consumption piece. And so a tweak that I would suggest to listeners this week is to unfollow three accounts that really tempt you on social media. So if they're tempting you because you're comparing your life to theirs, unfollow. If they're tempting you because they are a fashion influencer or an Amazon influencer and they are telling you to buy these things that you didn't even know you needed, but now you need it because you saw it, just unfollow them. And if you are really afraid, what if I need to find a cute outfit for my daughter? And I really like this, the way this blogger dresses her daughter or whatever, write it down on a list in your phone. You don't have to forget the handle altogether, but you don't need that in your feed on a daily basis. So just choose three to unfollow and see how that helps you with the consumption. I heard it said, you can't help but compare what you see. So when we unsee things, it's a lot easier not to compare. And I think that's good advice across the board. Like if somebody's making you feel, Ugh, it's not them. It's, you know, it's like you can just bless and release them. I always tell people, if, if I'm not helping you, if I'm causing you to be comparing yourself or I'm, you know, then please unfollow because that's not my intention. And I think anybody oh. online would agree. So I love that piece of advice. Okay, Shannon. Uh, can you tell everybody where they can find you? Because your Instagram handle, I want to make sure they get the underscore. So give us all the places so that they can connect with you. Sure. I'd love to. Okay. So on Instagram, I'm at pairing underscore down. And just to make a note that pairing does not have an eye on it, an eye in it. So it's not like a pair of socks, you know, yes. <laughs> it's a little different. Um, and I don't say that condescendingly. I say that because literally everyone, even the smartest people I know, put an eye in pairing down. Uh, so without the eye. Um, you can also get all of my free resources, my guide to decluttering kids stuff, um, my book that published in 2020, the links to the podcast, all of that at my website, which is theexpertbeginner.com. And I do have that podcast, which is the Paring Down Podcast. I love it. Oh, so many great things. Shannon, thank you for sharing your expertise. There's so many practical ideas that I know is going to be motivating. I bet they're already starting to get their donation bin together and thinking about that. So way to go. Thank you for joining me and taking your time to be here today. 
Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. If you liked this episode, it would mean so much if you'd share it with a friend or leave a quick rating and review so others can find our show. Until next time, you can find me at Simple Purposeful Living on Instagram and Facebook.